actually uh, have quite a number of other people that I think are coming, or we believe are coming, whether they can't find a path, that's probably the key problem around here. But um, we've also uh, discovered that maybe people have heard about the parking problem and just decided to just pay attention to the live streaming, which we do need to warn you is happening. So um, if, if you're not wanting to be involved in the live streaming, perhaps you can sit at the back or something. <laughs> 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 We do welcome you here today. I'm Wendy Sargent, I'm the um, Acting Director of Trinity College and Trinity is pleased to sponsor this uh, seminar this afternoon. So let uh, me introduce to you Mark Berry and I'm going to read because I didn't quite have a time to learn this off by heart. <laughs> Mark, Mark is the Community Mission Facilitator with the Church Missionary Society in the UK. A former youth worker, Mark has worked with the Church of England in several roles, including developing an open spirituality space in a state secondary school. In 2005, he founded a missional community in Telford called Safe Space and ran a night cafe for young adults. Over several years, he developed a ministry with his local football club, Mark's current role with CMS is about developing every member mission and tools for missional living. So we do welcome you, Mark. Before we do that, I would like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which we are gathering today and to honour and support uh, Indigenous leadership wherever it is. And to welcome you. Loving God, we give you thanks for today. We thank you that you are a great God. A great God who is interested in things that, that are new, things that are innovative, but also things that are old and beautiful. We give you thanks that we can come today and that we can be a part of that. We thank you for all the gifts and skills that are represented here. Pray that you will be with Mark as he shares with us in Jesus' name. Amen. So welcome, Mark Don't clap yet, I haven't started. <laughs> well, thank you. Thanks for coming. Um, I'm going to try desperately not to look at the screen because it's going to be really <laughs> disconcerting to see an image. But hello to everyone who's watching on the screen. <laughs> um, it's great to be here. I've been in Australia for just under a week, I think, now. And uh, if you've seen the program, you'll know that we're jetting off all, all over, not all over the country, because it's a big place, um, but uh, quite a bit further. We're going south tomorrow, and then Sydney, and Newcastle, and Dobbo, and uh, Melbourne, and Canberra, and Perth, eventually, and flying home from Perth on the 25th of August. So we have seen a little bit of your country, your beautiful country. Uh, thank you for uh, um, allowing summer to continue, because I know this is what summer is like for you all the time, as it is for us in the UK. So thanks for allowing that to continue over so we don't feel quite so uh, cold and it's lovely and balmy. And my son and, uh, and wife are off swimming in the, in the, the uh, beach in the, on the South Bank today, so... Uh, <laughs> this isn't cold. <laughs> so, um, it's great to be here. Um, and you've heard a little bit of a pen pour tra trait on me. I'm not sure how accurate it is. It's fairly accurate. Um, my background is in, uh, is in various things, but most relevantly in youth ministry, and I'll talk a little bit about that. Um, and then over the last 20, yeah, 20 odd years now, we've been exploring this idea of Christian community. Uh, something that we've just done an interview on, on the, the, one of the, the Christian radio stations, UCB and Vision, I think, and he insisted on calling it modern monasticism. But I think when we started the conversation 20 odd years ago about this, we were talking about modern monasticism, but then the whole postmodern, modernist kind of debate in, ensued, and gradually it sort of translated to uh, new monasticism rather than modern monasticism. Uh, so that's what I'm going to talk about today. What I'm going to do is I'll give you a little bit of uh, some of really how I started in this conversation 20 years ago. 
um, some of the key things that have really influenced me in my thinking. But then particularly what, for the first section, we're going to look at four different things that are happening within uh, what's become known as new monasticism, and I'm going to highlight those and throw up a few quotes from different communities in the UK just to illustrate some of those things, and then we'll also talk uh, a bit about uh, what we're doing and the story of my community, just to give you some illustrations, really, of, uh, of what's happening. Um, Scott, I think, has already mentioned we have got some uh, these books on the way, and they're with a courier somewhere, we don't quite know where, um, but uh, they will arrive at some point, but if they don't arrive, Scott has got some uh, forms, some information about how you can get hold of a, a copy of this. That's the commercial bit over. I try, try not to do any more, but um, uh, if you want to have a look, if they don't arrive and you want to have a look at this, I'll, I will leave it and then you can have a look and see a bit about it. Um, it's a book that was written by myself and a, a guy called Ian Mobsby, some of you may have uh, heard of, who is the priest at a community in the city centre of London called Moot. Um, and we, we were asked to write this book by Canterbury Press. And what's quite nice is that we have very different backgrounds and very different contexts. It gives you a bit of a flavour of the breadth of what's happening, as well as telling some stories about different communities and some practical things about how we can uh, develop rhythms of life and so on. So it's a mixture, and there's also um, some uh, liturgy and various other things in there. But Ian is from a, a community in the city centre of London has developed very much a Benedictine style community in the city centre, right in the heart, by right, literally right behind St Paul's Cathedral, um, in a church called St Mary's, Old and Mary, down in the city of London. And I'm up in a place called Telford, which is about three and a half hours drive from London, up in the West Midlands. Um, I don't know if any of you know how well you know England, but in, uh, we're about halfway between Birmingham and the Welsh border. So we're about three and a half hours in a very different context. So the book sort of tells a bit of that story, gives a bit of theory, a bit of liturgy, um, and some practical stuff as well. That's the last I'm going to talk about the book, because um, otherwise it would just feel like a commercial. Um. So to begin with, I just wanted to really highlight a little bit of my story and why this conversation, this stuff around new monasticism has um, really emerged. And I think one of the interesting things that, uh, in my story, and I think for all of us that are exploring this, is there was never really any, any intent to do so. There was never any conversation where people sat down and said, I know what, let's see what it's like to be new monastic. <laughs> there was never any sense that this was a direction that people were going in. I think what happened with most of the folk who were involved in this conversation is that there were a few things in their own spiritual journeys and their experience with church and mission and spirituality that they started to explore and express. And there came a point when we looked at it and said, do you know what, this looks a little bit like. Uh, and from that point, we started to talk about it a bit more and share with some of the other folk who were doing it. And I think the conversation really emerged uh, from different places. Some of you may be uh, aware of alternative worship. Um, that happened, and I know there was some stuff going on here as well, but in the UK, uh, the Greenbelt Festival was really a hotbed for sort of people exploring different kinds of worship and spirituality. And then also different kinds of community. And so in some sense, the new monasticism has been a, a thread that has brought together youth ministry, um, emerging church, alternative worship, and so on, in an exploration of saying, well, what, where do we go? Once these sort of fads and these things, that these conversations, what actually develops? And in the, in the UK, and I think also the US to an extent, New monasticism has kind of grown from that. But I wanted to tell, tell really two very uh, practical stories that got me really thinking about uh, where we were going as a uh, Christian community. And they relate to these passages here in Luke 10, when Jesus sends out the 72, but also Jeremiah 29. The first story um, begins in uh, a uh, little town in Kent, a place called Seven Oaks, where I was training to be a youth minister. And one night, I was uh, sat in our open youth club that we had with all the kids who were sort of mucking about and doing the thing that open youth clubs. If I use any terminology, by the way, that you don't know, just wave at, wave at me or shout at me and say, can you explain that? Can you translate it? And I will do. So we had this open youth club, which was just a place for kids to gather. And I was sat outside on the steps with the, with the boys who were smoking, which is where I spent most of my time, not smoking, but just sitting with them. And... Uh, 
And suddenly this guy rode past. And he rode past on something which I have a little bit of a passion for, which was an Italian motor scooter, a Vespa. <laughs> and uh, he drove past and pulled into the house next door. And uh, so I sort of got up and wandered over and leant over the fence and started having a chat with this guy. And it was a typical uh, English evening, so um, he had his helmet on, scarves, gloves, waterproofs, all sorts of instruments. So I couldn't really see much of this fella. And we chatted away, and he said, oh, um, he said, well, if you're interested, there's a bunch of us meet every Sunday lunchtime down at the pub, the rough end of town. Um, come down. So I thought, yeah, all right. So the next Sunday I finished church and uh, jumped on my Vespa and rode down to this pub. And I sat there, I got in, and there was nobody there. I sat in this pub for a while, and nothing happened. And then suddenly this guy walked in. And it's no exaggeration to say that he looked like a rugby league player. His <laughs> shoulders were out here, and he was about this high. Uh, it's about six foot four, six foot five. Um, and I'm not tall and you know, not built like a rugby league player. So he was quite kind of an impressive figure. And he was dressed head to toe in black. A black combat jacket black uh, army trousers, black boots up to his knees. Um, the only bits of colour were that he had red laces in his boots, red braces, um, and there were a whole load of badges on his sleeve. And as, I, as he turned, walked into the pub and turned around at the bar, I noticed these badges on his sleeve. Uh, and they were symbols which uh, would normally make me run a mile. Swastikas and white pride and all of this kind of right wing neo-Nazi stuff. And I thought, oh no, God, you know, I wonder what I've, what's going on in this pub. Um, I wonder why I've come here and I'm just going to hide in the corner and see what happens. And as I kind of shuffled into the corner, <coughs> the chap turned around and pointed at me and went, Mark! <laughs> Glad you could come. Great to see you. Came storming over and took my hand and shook my hand. I thought, what am I going to do? And then gradually more of the same guy came in different heights. <laughs> some were small and brown, some were tall and thin, and some were built like him, and I sat there until I was surrounded by about 20 of these guys and girls, um, and the girls were just as scary as the guys. <laughs> and I had to think to myself, what am I going to do? What, what do I do? Do I disappear? Here am I, I'm a youth worker of a Baptist church at the time, and in the middle of nice leafy seven oaks, dealing with all these kids who went to uh, private schools and, you know, well-to-do kids. And here am I sat in a pub with a bunch of neo-Nazi students. <coughs> what am I going to do? Um, and I didn't know what to do. I thought, well, I'm going to write it out, and then I'll go home. And, you know, I could go home and think, well, oh, lesson learned, I'm not going to that pub again. <laughs> Make my excuses. And I thought, you know what, I can't do that. I just can't do that. That just doesn't feel right. So, and as I was sat around the table, the, the, the chap said to me, um, so, he said, you're interested in joining our club? <laughs> and I said, well, I said, the thing is, my politics are probably, well, let's say they're somewhat left of yours. <laughs> um, and, you know, I'm a Christian, I don't really, it doesn't, you know, he said, don't, he said, don't worry, he said, uh, um, and I said, well, if I hang around with you guys, if I become part of this, you have to realise that if you're involved in violence, if you're being, you know, oppressing somebody, abusing someone, that I will be with them and you'll have to go through me first. <laughs> the answer came back immediately, yeah, that's no problem. <laughs> <laughs> I'm still not quite sure what was meant by that comment. <laughs> And I ended up spending two years living with these guys, um, whilst still training to be a youth minister. Um, and uh, I, I just basically hung out, spent most of my time, and I wasn't um, writing essays and uh, doing church things, going on rallies and hanging out with these guys, going to their weddings and going to rallies and all sorts of things with these people. Um, one slightly uh, uh, amusing story was one of the guys in the church was um, uh, a retired policeman and he had been the, in charge of policing for Millwall Football Club. I don't know if anyone's heard of Millwall Football Club. Well, their, their famous chant is, no one likes us, we don't care. <laughs> um, it, it's very known for being uh, uh, violent and having a sort of very right wing. It's right in the east end of London. And... Uh, 
one guy, this uh, one time this, this police officer said to me, he knew I was into football, he said, well, you know, why don't you come to the boardroom? Come and come to a game with me. I said, yeah, yeah, that'd be great for the game. And as we walked in, there was a great big poster with all these faces on of people who were banned from the football club. And as I walked in, I looked at him and I know him. Oh, I was drinking him last night. I know him. <laughs> <laughs> These were some of the characters. But, you know, when I had to then work out what does my faith look like? And went there am I trained to be a youth worker in this lovely, leafy, well-to-do place and spending my, the rest of my time with, with people who I didn't actually like. Uh, and the question came to me about how do I actually, if, if I'm to live with people, what does love mean in this context? What does it mean to, to love people? Um, and so much of my um, experience at church was that it was a club of people who were like each other and who liked each other, or at least pretended to like each other, um, but were, were very similar. It was church as club. And I wanted to kind of, in this experience, wrestle with, well, what does church as community mean? When these guys who were neo-Nazi skinheads had much more of a real sense of community than the people that I sat in the pews with on a Sunday. And I really had to wrestle because I went in there with this idea or met these people and thought, you know, these are all horrible people. And yet, I've never experienced such a sense of community. Uh, and I spent many hours sitting with them um, and just hanging out with them. I remember 36 hours when I didn't go home and one of the girls um, had had to have an emergency hysterectomy. And as a bunch of I sat in this lounge with, with her and her boyfriend and several other people and the whole room was just crying for this girl. I thought, what a real sense of community where they're able to cry together. These guys who are football hooligans, neo-Nazi skinners, can sit around and cry with each other because one of the girls has had, can no longer have or couldn't have children. And what a real sense of community. And there's so much wrong with it. But that was, I guess, a, a part of the journey for me. The second little story I wanted to tell as an introduction was that um, when I was working in a church, my first post as a youth minister was a large church. We'd managed to build a good youth work. We had a couple of hundred young people going to this church. Um, and it was great. We were doing all sorts of nightclub worship and all sorts of funky stuff. And it was really exciting. And then I had a phone call one day from uh, the local father because the, uh, the church was in South London and it was a big church. It was down the bottom of the hill. It was only 125 years old, so it was quite a new church, <laughs> relatively speaking, of course. Um, and up on top of the hill was the old church. And it was a very small church. Not many people went there. Very traditional, very high church, very Anglo-Catholic, as we'd call it. Uh, and the chap there had been there for about 25 years, the vicar. He, he called, called himself father, single man. And he rang me up one day. And he said, um, we met at a church leaders' gathering. He said, Mark, I've got a problem. I said, okay, what's, what's the problem? And he said, well, there's a secondary school, and the big secondary school in the, in the, uh, the area was, near, was in his parish, next door to his um, church. And there were about uh, 2,000 young people in this school. And he said uh, that the, one of the young people, a 14-year-old boy, had committed suicide. And it was on the anniversary that his dad had committed suicide. Mm -hmm. uh, and this had really affected the school. And he said, the problem is that, that yeah, there are young people, there are children coming across from the school and they're coming into the church and they're writing things on bits of paper and they're putting them on the altar. What should I do? And he said, I said, well, what do, you, you know, what, what do you think? He said, well, I was wondering about locking the church and whether that's the right thing to do. And I said, well, you know, but he didn't really want to. So I said, well, what, let's, let's jump in a car together and let's go down to WH Smith's, which is a big chain uh, stationery, and buy a big block of post-it notes and a couple of big boxes of biro pens and leave them on the altar. And within a week, the altar was covered with post-it notes. Mm -hmm. um, some of which I think he, during the services he had to move around to the back because there were things written on them that were, he didn't, you know, <laughs> might upset certain people <laughs> in the congregation. But, but, there they, but the kids were expressing something about spirituality, if you like. They're expressing grief and struggle and anguish and all of those things which we hope we feel free to express. And I suddenly, it, it occurred to me as, we, as this was going on, that there was like patting myself on the back. And we as a church, as a large church, well-known church, were patting ourselves on the back because we had 200 young people coming to our youth group doing our youth service. And yet there were 2,000 young people in this school who didn't have anywhere to go, didn't have anywhere expressive. So 
these stories began to kind of, these experiences began to make me think, well, actually, what does Christian community look like? What is church for? Um, and so part of this, is, I guess, has been a shift away from seeing spirituality uh, as consumerism, uh, church as club, and mission as recruitment, to trying to see spirituality as, uh, as that sort of cry of the heart, of that openness and the brokenness. Um, community as that place where we can cry together, and mission as actually transformative love. How we as the communities are able to kind of live within the community and love and serve. So my ministry started to shift um, fairly early on, and, and it's been part of this journey that really says, okay, what does this look like? And these two passages that I've put up are kind of foundational passages for me. There's lots of passages. Uh, when I was speaking the other day, I had my t-shirt on with Micah 6 on it, with you know, act justly, love mercy, and walk humbly. That's another one. But Luke 10, there's two bits. There's a very small bit in Luke 10, which uh, Alan Roxburgh talks about, which I think affected me quite strongly. Um, as someone who travels a lot with my work with the Church Mission Society and goes to strange places, uh, there's a little bit in Luke 10 when Jesus has sent out the 72. And, and he says to them, he says, go lightly, go with no baggage. Knock on doors, knock on peace. And when you go in, eat what is put before you, for a, for a workman his work is higher. Uh, and that's quite, a, a, to me, as I began to kind of explore and say, well, what does this mean? And I remember Alan Roxburgh was talking about this, and he said, when it says a workman is worth his hire, often we interpret that to mean that God will provide for us as we're doing mission. And he said, no, no, actually, if you look at it, what it means is it's a challenge to become part of the economic unit, to become so involved that you are actually part of that community. Uh, and the first bit where it says, eat what's put before you, well, I, as I say, I... I, I travel quite a lot, and um, I went to one of the trips I did to work was, uh, with, was to Korea. And I, I don't really like fish. Um, and there we were, and the bishop took us to this, this sort of restaurant, and all these dishes were coming out in front of us. And when I got home, I, 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 I said to my wife, you know, well, she said to me, what's the food like? And I said, well, I, br I broke it up into thirds. There was a third that I knew what it was. There was a third that I didn't know what it was and I was happy to ask. And there was a third that I didn't know what it was and if I was going to eat it, I really didn't want to know what it was. Uh, and that said to me, well, but there we are embedded. So what, I have to eat what is put before me as part of that, uh, you know, part of being there, part of that culture. And in a sense, we see that as one short space. But the Jeremiah 29, which is in one of my, it's, been, it's verse 7, I think. And, it, it, you know, there are the people, they're in exile. And they're talking to the prophet, and they're saying, you know, help us, get, we want to go home. We want to go back home. And, and the prophet turns around and says, no, no, no. Just, you know, you, this is where you've been put. Stay here. Marry your daughters. Marry your daughter's daughters. Plant gardens. Start businesses. Pray and work for the peace and prosperity of Babylon. For on their peace is yours founded. So that sense of, there they have to learn to be community within that community. So I think as that, those two passages, I think, which really have kind of impacted me on my journey to say, well, what does it mean to be part of community? What does it mean to be, uh, if you like, sacrificial and, and sacramental, which is to be giving up, but also to be there as a visible sign of God's grace? Not only as an individual, and often we think of mission as an individual thing, but what does it mean to be a community that's place. And in a sense, this is where the new monasticism for me started to explore. Because as I begin to say, well, what does it mean to be a community that's placed in mission within a community? And living in that community with people that we might struggle with, people who are broken. In the UK, we uh, um, obviously have a long history of, of monasticism. And I'm going to break that down. Uh, there's one particular thing that I'll break down in a moment. But actually what you find, and I was doing, when I was doing a thing on the radio um, only an hour or so ago, the, the uh, interviewer kept trying to talk about monasticism as taking yourself away. Um, but actually, if you go and travel, if you ever get the chance to travel around the UK, you'll find that in a lot of the old towns in the UK, there's an abbey right at the centre of the community, right at the heart of the place. And, there, and they started the schools and the hospitals, um, the mental institutions, the welfare systems, were often started and founded by monks and nuns. Mm. Not just in the UK, but all over the world. So what would it mean, to, you know, as we began to say, well, here we are a community in the midst of community, wanting to be peacemakers and healers, to do as Jesus said when he told the 72, to heal the sick, heal the sick and, and speak about the kingdom. What, 
that began for us to sort of, in a sense, create some resonances with what we could see around us. And in fact, in, in Telford, one, uh, we went to Telford, moved to Telford 10 years ago, and I went as a mission partner with the Church Mission Society, uh, but with no brief. Um, and we'll come on to thinking about some of this stuff about our community later. But they said, just go and, uh, and, and be creative and create a Christian community. Um, and they just gave us a house and said, go on, go do something different for people who don't connect with church. Um, and we started, we were exploring this idea of new monasticism. And uh, then I was down at my dad's, when my dad was retiring, and he was uh, busy taking the books off his shelf and packing them off, and really wanted me there to help to get rid of some of the books, I think. And we pulled one off the shelf, and as it came off, this map fell on the floor. <clears throat> and it was an English heritage map of religious monuments in the UK. And I opened it up, just out of interest, and, I, and of course my eyes gravitated to Telford, where I live. And there on Telford was this little uh, stone carving uh, that said the Shropshire Monastic Trail. And we actually, we discovered that there was a whole ring of ancient monastic communities. Uh, and in fact, the, we discovered later that the last monks moved out of Telford only 20 years ago, 10 years before we moved there. So there was that sense of history, and I'll come back to that. So th that's what we began to explore. Uh, and there are others exploring the same sort of thing, or different aspects of new monasticism, right across the UK and indeed the world. So I'm going to introduce you to and talk about uh, four things. But before we do that, just to clear it up, oops. yeah, these are the four things that I'm going to talk about. Uh, tradition, community, spirituality, and mission. Because what I think is happening within uh, new monasticism is a reframing of these things. And certainly a move away from them being seen as departments. Um, so, you know, the, the idea that you've got to worship, you do worship, and then you do mission, and then you do prayer, and you do these different things. And to say, actually, the reframing of those to see how they mesh together, and how they're integrated, and how they rely on each other. One of the early people to start writing about new monasticism was way before I was born, and, and his name is Dietrich Bonhoeffer. And he said this, The restoration of the church will surely come only from a new type of monasticism, which has nothing in common with the old, but a complete lack of compromise in a life lived in accordance with the Sermon on the Mount. I think it's time to gather people together to do this. And, and I think that's one of the threads. That, along with other things um, like liberation theology and, and some of the traditions in the UK, have kind of come together... In, in some of these strains. I actually think in one sense he's a little bit wrong, because I think that the, the new monasticism does have a connection with the uh, old communities, and I'll come back to that in a moment. Just before I kind of move on to look at new monasticism, a little definition for you, just a distinction. And uh, I, you know, the chap who was talking to on the radio didn't quite get this distinction, or at least he didn't really, he wanted to have this idea about people going off and being hermits. Um, two words, monarchos and freres, monastics and mendicants. Um, and I've put two pictures up there just for fun. Um, this, I like this character here. I have no idea who he is. He's a pilgrim of some sort. I just like the picture. Um, you know, a uh, bit of a hipster beard going on there, isn't he? But, you know. um, so the distinction being monarchos, mon mon uh, monks, um, which largely comes from the root uh, of the word meaning solitary, singular. Um, so the idea, in one sense, of monks was people who, who moved away in, into solitary, the hermits, if you like. That's got expanded, but that's the root of the word. And then frères, brothers, friars. And of course, we, we know that we have, tend to have the distinction between monks and friars um, in religious life. In terms of men, of course, we've got nuns and sisters uh, in terms of the female side of things. So we've got monks and mendicants. I think and we explore this a bit in the book, that actually the majority of new monastic communities are not really monks. So new monasticism is a little bit of a misnomer. But it's just what's the language that's kind of, you know, really what we probably ought to be talking about is new friars. Communities of friars. The difference being that monks is that sense of going away, and friars tended to be in the city, or in the centre of cities, reliant on the communities around them to sustain them and relying on that brotherhood. brotherhood. So, in many ways, I think actually most new monastic communities are really mendicants, are really friars. Um, 
But we can see that actually religious, the religious life covers both aspects of that sense of the going away, spirituality as moving to the edges of the empire. And of course in the UK, uh, we talk about the desert on the uh, desert in the ocean. I don't think you've come across that phrase, uh, which relates back to the Cappadocians and the um, the desert fathers, Antony and so on, who moved into the desert. Although, of course, they didn't move out and out of connection with the culture because that wasn't what they were for. But in the UK, when uh, monasticism began, there were no deserts. There were, I mean, I know you have deserts, but we don't have. It might, I know it might surprise you. <laughs> But we don't have deserts in the UK, but what we do have is lots of far-flung places, islands, and you've probably seen pictures of Skellig Michael and the beehive huts. So they, they have this idea of moving to the edges. Um, but actually most of us, I think, are really a mendicant. So, we're going to have a look at these four things now. So first of all, the idea of reframing tradition. The key aspect, I suppose, is that actually most of these communities, most of these new monastic communities, are in, in, to some extent in pursuit of an ageless faith. We've grown up in the modern world. We've grown up in a world which says, for better or worse, we are the pinnacle of human experience. Humanity has evolved. We have become more civilised. And we've grown up with that idea of, if you like, um, cultural evolution and civilization in our culture. But over 20, the last 20 or 30 years, actually, I think what we've began to see is that, and this is one of the indicators, if you like, that leads people to talk about postmodernism, is the idea that maybe that is a falsehood, that we're not evolving, we're not improving. In fact, some people go so far as to say that, the, that this civilization is actually about corruption of what we used to know and used to be like, and there's a romanticism that connects with that. But the sense that actually if we're not evolving, if humanity is not kind of in this constant sort of improving itself, then maybe we've lost things. As we've moved forward, maybe there are things that have got left behind that were rich and that would feed us as Christians and as human beings. So that sense of, of valuing the wisdom of the faithful of the past is quite significant. To say, what did those people have and as someone who grew up very much in a, a, a Western uh, situation where we didn't, you know, we didn't talk about these people of the past because they were, they were a bit daft and a bit old and a bit you know, irrelevant and uh, probably even a bit heretical, people began to explore some of the wisdom of the past. People began to read about the Desert Fathers, to read Ignatius, to read um, Eusebius, to read about the past and say, what is there in this stuff that happened in the past? that actually may really help us in our situation today. So that valuing the wisdom of the faithful of the past. But also to then locate faith within our faith, within the wider story of faith. To see our connection with the whole of faith. In fact, one of our liturgies, uh, as an illustration... Um, yeah, um, this is a bit from uh, one of our communion liturgies. Uh, and it, it, just a little section from it. it says, in sharing this meal we share not only with each other, but with people of faith the world over. Uh, male and female, rich and poor, powerful and weak, experienced and naive, old and young, global and local, every race and every creed. All approach the table as equals. As Jesus laid down his authority at the table, so we lay down any remnants of pride, prejudice and self-importance, and any feelings of inadequacy, insecurity and hurt. This is a global table. All are welcome. All are equal. Not only is this table one amongst many across the planet, it is a timeless place. We eat together in a meal shared by seekers and believers through the ages. Disciples and desert fathers, Celts and Catholics, Western Puritans and Eastern Orthodox, conservatives and charismatics, liberal and liberationists, the certain and the uncertain, modern and postmodern, the hurting and the healers. In eating together, we join in the history of God's church. So that's just a little part of one of our communion liturgies. That sense that actually we're connected. Uh, and that's really important. So we're locating the faith within a wider story of faith. But then also, therefore, if we're able to do that, one of the key things within this new monastic thing is then seeing the gospel, our experience of the gospel, as always located in culture. Um, the, the, I can't remember who it was now said that the, the gospel is never dislocated from culture. It always emerges in culture. So then the, the key thing for the new monastics as we explore this is that understanding that our engagement with the gospel 
is located in our experience, in our culture, and that does not negate other people's experiences of the gospel and locating the gospel that emerges from their culture. But then also, that then leads to this active sense of we want to locate the gospel in culture. Not only do we acknowledge that it is, but we also really want to locate the gospel in culture. So, valuing the faith of the past and locating the, the, our faith within the wider story, understanding it's located in our culture, and then this active sense of wanting to see it located and relocated again in culture. Robert Weber uh, wrote this. Those who are called to an ancient future Christianity will do so with a humble dependence on the Spirit. By affirming uh, the ancient roots of faith, a connection to God's people in all times and everywhere, and a commitment to an authentic engagement with culture. If we're going to live that, and if we're going to experience that in new monastics, one of the, the monasticism, one of the things that's happened, particularly over the last three years, is a recognition that new monasticism is part of an engagement with Christian community living and spirituality and mission that goes back a long time. We can look at, we can read Eusebius, we can read uh, um, in Irenaeus, we can look at all that, we can read the Desert Fathers, but actually we've got history living right with us today. So we've been actively, as a community of, if you like, a network, trying to develop links with traditional monasticism. And, and this year, in fact, we, ho we hosted a big gathering up in Whitby, which was uh, opened by the Archbishop of Canterbury. Um, and it is, I don't know if you can read that, it's called Treasures Old and New, Exploring How the Spirit is Moving in Traditional and Emerging Communities. And what we're beginning to see now is this great relationship between traditional monastics and uh, new monastics. And what's so refreshing, just as, as uh, part of this conversation, is that having spent so often in churches as a youth worker, trying to do new things as youth workers are always wanting to do, <laughs> oh, seekers and worshippers of novelty, um, <laughs> and being told, no, 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 we don't do it that way. <laughs> to then go to these folk who are wandering around in habits and expecting that reaction and finding them saying, wow, we love what you guys are doing. We recognize that it's different, but we also recognize that it's part of the same conversation, part of the same story. So we had this wonderful gathering up in Whitby, and it's not the first, but this is the biggest one that we've, we've had with the blessing of the Archbishop, to look at how we can renew this religious life, within, particularly within the Church of England, but, but also wider, and how those traditional monastics can actually hold us new ones accountable. And I think that's really interesting, that they're saying to us, refreshers, and we're saying to them, hold us accountable, teach us. And so that dialogue is going on, which is really, really refreshing, really exciting, um, and it's really important. If we're going to, we, we can't, it would be kind of ironic if all the new monastics were saying, oh, we, we've got part of this Asian space, but we don't want to talk to you guys, you're old. It would sort of be a bit ironic. So um, that, fortunately, that is not happening. Just, I thought uh, it would be kind of fun just to show that I'm, this is not just me saying this, this is not me. What I've done for each of these is to pull some quotes from some of the communities I know quite well uh, and, of, and those who have written. This is only really scraping the surface. Um, the, it's incredible that actually these communities are emerging all over the place in the UK. Not all of them are writing stuff, not all of them are expressing it, but we're getting to visit and talk to these guys. And they are uh, of all ages and of all cultures. Um, which is fantastic. Um, so, just some quotes, just to illustrate some of this. Maybe it's uh, a community, they describe themselves as a community following in the way of Jesus for a better world now. They say, we are inspired by people like St. Columba of Iona, St. Francis of Assisi, and St. Teresa of Calcutta, whose lives seem to have been grounded in simplicity and prayerfulness. Maybe it's diving deep into the ocean of Christian spirituality to seek more balanced prayer and simple ways to live. I mentioned Moot in London. They say this very simply. We recognize the inspiration of saints, mystics, philosophers, and artists throughout the centuries. And another community based in Oxford uh, called Home. You'll notice, I, I, I hate to, you know, how, how uh, kind of trendy these communities are. They always use very strange use of capitalization. <laughs> uh, it's just one of those things at the moment. We are rooted and grounded in the ancient story of Christ as expressed in the one holy, catholic, and apostolic church. The guardianship of the story has now been passed to our generation, and home as a community is working out what it means to live out our chapter of the story 
in our day, in our place, and in our culture. So this is, in a sense, this reframing of tradition and understanding the wealth and depth of tradition. Um, and that's really important. I think it's both important in terms of inspiring what's going on, but it's also really important in making sure that these new communities are not just little cults, personality cults, trendy things, novelty exercises, but are based in some wider and deeper story. Second uh, thing is the pursuit of community. Um, and this is really quite interesting, because I think what we're, for me anyway, I think what we're seeing within uh, new monasticism is the desire for community that is based on shared vision <coughs> rather than style. Um, and I'm talking to the guy on the radio today, and I'm saying, you know, what's great is that, because he, he said to me, he said, oh, of course, um, he said, our radio station is largely speaking to and listened to by evangelicals, and so they wouldn't have ever heard anything like that. And I said, well, you know, one of the great things about, uh, that I'm experiencing within new monastic communities is that um, you can have a new monastic community that has Catholics, liberals, evangelicals, etc., being community. Mm. Um, it is not based on a particular, no, no community is based on a particular theological bent or um, style of worship. It's not like, you know, it's not like my friends who sort of travel around when they moved uh, and said, well, we're going to try every church in the town and see which one fits us. Um, you know, this is a sense of people wanting a genuine sense of community. It does make it difficult. It does make it interesting for many of them as they struggle to find identity because of what the defining factor is. Um, and, and how they're doing it largely is by a sense of being covenant community. Communities that promise to each other, rather than communities that are based on, well, if you like what we're doing now, come. If you don't, then there's another church down the road. But saying, actually, have, we need to be covenanted to each other. We need to make promises. Some communities make vows. Most new, community, new monastic communities don't make vows. Uh, there are one or two um, new monastic communities that make life vows, but not many. They're largely... Uh, Know, the, the relation thing. But some of the communities, like the Northumbria community, which is a dispersed community, do have the option, and the community of Aiden Hill, do have the option of taking life vows. Um, the pursuit of community, shared vision, not style, covenant community, but also within that relationship that I think one of the things that we're all exploring uh, and not always got right is there's a Celtic tradition or Celtic practice, some of you may have heard of, called Anamkara. Mm -hmm. Yeah, some of you have heard of Anamkara. So, it's looking at leadership as sole friendship rather than hierarchy and structure. So within a community, I speak for our community, we have this sole friendship relationship with each other. So when one of our community members calls on another one to talk, to share, to pray, it is really, I say the duty, but it's not duty, um, but it is the onus on that person to give that time. It is part of the relationship, part of the covenant, that if one of my community members needs to struggle and talk to me and share with me, I will give that time. I'm committed to do that. Um, and then we have particular relationships of soul friendship that are connected uh, around how we share together. Uh, different communities do it in different ways, um, but this idea of soul friendship is quite, uh, it's quite universal. Quite universal, you can't say that, can you? Um, <laughs> Um, Brother Samuel is a good friend of, uh, of ours, uh, who is an amazing guy. Uh, he is the abbot of Hillfield Priory <coughs> on the south coast of England, a Franciscan monastery, um, said this, The renewal of both the church and society will come through the re-emergence of forms of Christian community that are homes of generous hospitality, places of challenging reconciliation, and centres of attentiveness <coughs> to the living God. And, and I quite like that sense, well, quite like the, the idea of generous hospitality. Um, one of my friends who's at the Queen's uh, Theological College in Birmingham has just write, uh, written his PhD and he's coming out in a book soon where he, he looks at hospitality. And, and he's, it's a very challenging perspective. Um, he's, his name is Simon Sutcliffe, if you want to look him up. Um, and he said, he said this, um, he said, when we talk about hospitality, because most of us are Western, white, middle class, when we talk about hospitality, we make the assumption that we are the hosts. And there's a power dimension there. So he said, but if you look at scripture, what you find is that largely, 
Jesus and the disciples when they do hospitality of the guests. So how do we think about hospitality that's generous as a guest? So there's being a good host for the gospel, if you like, but there's also a sense of what it means to be a good guest. Uh, and I think there's a real sense of how am I a guest? How do I see myself as always a guest? Fully kind of impacted and how you balance the Luke 10 thing of becoming part of the economic unit, but seeing yourself always as a guest in the community um, is quite challenging. How we do that well. And I think, um, and excuse me if I stray onto uh, theological territory here for a moment, um, what a, a, I think it comes down to an exploration of, of a particular um, theology that's been bouncing around for a few years now, um, for a long time I'm sure, but particularly spoken about and stressed by people like Leonardo Boff in Good Deliberation Theology and, uh, and, and others. And it's this, perichoresis. Are you all familiar with the, are people familiar with the idea of perichoresis? Okay. Um, so right at the heart of a lot of the new monastic movement is a deep sense of Trinitarianism. Uh, that we are reframing community fundamentally because that is our nature. That we are made in the image of God. So perichoresis, if, you don't, uh, if you're not familiar with the word, it, it, it talks about the, if you like, the dance of the Trinity. Paul Fides calls it the dance of the Trinity. Uh, and there are three key things. Uh, firstly, coexistence and self-surrender. As Jesus says, I'm one with the Father. But the idea that, that you know the Trinity was always coexistent. I, I'm just like I'm a picture person. So when I think about this, I think of the classic Mexican standoff with the three guys holding the this all pointing at each other. So everybody's got two guns pointed at them. Well, if you drop the guns out, because we can't. Um, and just have the idea that they're pointing at each other. And if you read through Scripture, as I see it, we get this idea that they're always pointing to each other. So Jesus is always pointing to the Father, and the mm -hmm. Father points it, and so on. You get this idea of, of of mutual, of coexistence, they're one with each other, but they're always pointing, there's always self-surrender as, as part of that dance. Uh, and that's part of Pericles. Secondly, is the idea of mutual indwelling. All may be one, that Jesus prays for us, he says, may they be one in me as I am in you. This sense of mutual indwelling, that we live not only with each other, but within each other. Uh, and so when, when we do that, and we think about that as, as community, each person in the community somehow imbibes something of the others. And we get that in a sense within the Trinity, that there is this blurring of, of, of individuals. And in fact, we have to go to that in a second. And the third thing, mutual involvement. One of my favourite little passages, and it's only really an indicator of the Trinity, is in Psalm 33, verse 6. And it says this, that uh, by his word the heavens were made, the starry host by his breath. Source, word, and breath. Um, and which is, when you think about it, it's a great picture. We, we, know, we think about the word logos, we think about breath, ruach, um, as, as part of, uh, of the Trinity, as an explanation of the Trinity. And for me, it's just a lovely picture. And, uh, you know, everyone struggled to find images for the Trinity, you know, egg and ice, steam and water, none of which work. But one of the, and this doesn't work fully, but the idea that, you know, when we communicate, there is a, an act of creation that's going on in our heads. We're thinking about what we're saying, the impact it has on other people. Um, does it communicate our meaning? It's a deep thought process because it's got such an impact what words we choose. We then form the word using our physical, our tongue, our palate, our mouth, our lips. But unless there's a breath which gives that word dynamic, there's still no communication. So there's a sense in community, in the community of the Trinity, that actually all these things are important. That, and that it's about relationships. It's about communication. So that's a little stupid, because I think this, in a sense, is as we begin to, and a lot of new monastics, and there was a whole section of it in the book, because it's a conversation that's going on, saying, how do we understand the Trinity? Because if the Trinity is how we are created, as God's, you know, as it says, we're made in the image of God, what does that look like? Um, for me, one of the great pictures of this, or, or, or preachers of this, is, is Desmond Tutu. And uh, I don't know if you're familiar with Ubuntu, uh, not the operating system. Um, there's an African, uh, South African, and the word in the South African culture is, is Ubuntu. And it, it, what it says is the basic un unit of humanity is not the individual, 
but the community. So Tutu says, I am me because we are we. Only in the context of community can we really discover who we are as an individual. We are not individuals. If we are particle persons, as, uh, if, if we're individuals. It's only in the context of relationship that we actually discover who we really are, because that's the way we're made. So there's a sense of community is, is uh, about that discovery of who we are, but also that imbibing and that perichoresis of relationship based on the Trinity, as a gift of the Trinity and as a reality of our creation. Sorry, I'm preaching now, I'll try and stop. Um, so Lino Oroboff, who I mentioned uh, earlier, said this, the community of the Blessed Trinity is not closed in on itself, it opens outward. All creation means an overflow of life and communion of the three divine persons, inviting all creatures, especially human creatures, to also enter into the place of communion between themselves and with the divine persons. And in a sense, I think that's been, it's gone hand in hand. As new monastics and uh, as folk have been trying to explore what community looks like, then there's been, been this deep, deepening exploration of the Trinity and theology of the Trinity. Because it goes hand in hand. As you want to explore what it is to be community, as a Christian, you can't help but explore the Trinity. And then as you explore the Trinity, you can't help but shape your understanding of community. Um, and, you know, we grew up in a culture where, I always talk about this, how we, um, we think about our leadership and our structures. And in the, West, in, in the UK, and I'm sure it's to some extent the same here, um, we had uh, a familial, before the, before the wars, we had a familial structure of, um, a feudal familiar structure of leadership in, in, our, in our culture. Um, after the wars, for all sorts of different reasons, we ended up with a military model. And, and in some sense, that's still how we think about society now. And you think a lot of businesses, and the way we think about it is that you've got the, the, the general at the top, and then you've got the next layer, layer of command, and then you've got the next layer of command, at the bottom you've got the foot soldiers. And we've got a pyramidal military model of leadership. Uh, and I don't know if you, you get old British TV, but if you look at uh, particularly British sitcoms from the 1960s and 70s, Anybody that's in any position of power is the boss of the company, is a captain or a major or a, a colonel or whatever, because that's what they knew. After the war and the family system had broken down because sons had got killed, they, they fell back onto a military model of leadership. And I think there's been this, as we begin to explore community, a sort of re-evaluation of that, and say, well, what does leadership, or what does community look like? Big part of that, food. Conrad Gemp wrote a lovely book, I don't know if some of you have seen it, um, called The Mealtime Habits of the Messiah. Um, 40 Meditations on the Mealtime Habits of the Messiah. This is about eating together. This is about that kind of base experience of humanity. And every single new monastic community that I know, at the heart of their time together is a meal. Eating together. And at the heart of that meal is the Eucharist. And, and that's a big part, part of the worship of New Monastics. It's been really interesting that a lot of us who grew up in evangelical traditions where communion had been pushed aside by the worship service um, are re have been rediscovering the communion as, as a central act of worship, as the breaking of bread which builds, binds us together as one body, as the cup of hope from the Seder meal, the fourth cup. Um, of course, Luke's Gospel has two cups, was not it? The third and fourth cup. Um, uh, and that sense that, that that's at the heart, which is a, a, all about the deep spirituality of, of mission and a, of Christ. So I think that at the heart of it is that is the table. And Brueggemann, uh, I'm not going to quote him, but Brueggemann um, in his book Living Toward a Vision, The Coming of People of Shalom, says the table is the one place that we discover that we are not ours and God is not ours, but we are God's. So that sense of giving at the table that reminds us that the faith of Christ is both sacrificial and sacramental, and then how that shapes. For us, that's really key. This is uh, just linking to my community. Um, and uh, this is a guy that we met uh, very early on in our, in our community. You know, we never, we never thought about having a patron saint at all. It, wasn't, it was never on our intention. Uh, we're not really into that particularly. But God led us to this guy, uh, and uh, because as we wanted to be community, we wanted to understand what it meant, and we felt that we needed a, a, somehow to have a new model of humanity, which challenged some of the consumerism and individualism. And we needed an engaged spirituality uh, that recognized the need for a vicarious faith, 
um, but a question how does it fit? And we also needed a, a sense of purpose, a sense of that shared vision. And as we kind of prayed together and said, you know, God, who are we? Um, he introduced us to this guy, and uh, this is just a photograph of our table, um, or one of our tables at a point. Um, uh, and and uh, he, he led us to this prayer, um, and it's a prayer by Sir Francis Drake, and it goes like this. Disturb us, Lord, when we are too well pleased with ourselves, when our dreams have come true because we have dreamed too little, when we arrive safely because we sail too close to the shore. Disturb us, Lord, when with the abundance of things we possess, we have lost our thirst for the waters of life. Having fallen in love with life, we have ceased to dream of eternity, and in our efforts to build a new earth, we have allowed our vision of the new heaven to dim. Disturb us, Lord, to dare more boldly to venture on wider seas, where storms will show your mastery, where losing sight of land we shall find the stars. We ask you to push back the horizons of our hopes and to push into the future in strength, courage, hope, and love. And that kind of narrative, and Brendan, and that's our icon that we painted. Uh, we, sorry, you don't paint icons. I got told off the other day uh, that you don't paint icons, you write icons. I got, told, I got told that by a nun when I was talking about this. At the she didn't even know. Um, and this, this is something of our story, because one of the key things, and if you look at a lot of these communities, as we're reframing community, at the heart of it is a foundation story, a narrative. Um, and for us, that whole story of Brendan has become a narrative. And if you look at the traditional monastics, they've got the same. Whether it's Benedict or Francis or some of this, have the narrative, which is not about control, but is about that shared story in which we can all live into. We can all find a place in that story. And it also begins to talk about who we are. So for us, this idea and our, our community, uh, this is our, our cross, our community cross, which is um, the cross of St. Brendan for Wales together. I didn't put mine on this morning, it's back at the where I was staying. Um, and, uh, and the idea of the, you know, our common story is about setting sail. That we've got a rule in our community, and our rule is we set sail. So, we'll talk about this a little bit later, but as we read scripture, we're always asking the question, Lord, where are you t what, what are you pushing us out into? How do we set sail with this? And that sense of a rule, which means that we read scripture in a certain way as a community, is part of that deep sense of community. We do our theology together rather than having a leader who does our theology for us and we accept it. And, and that is one of the key signs, I think, of some of these new monastic communities. So, uh, one you may have heard of, 24-7 prayer, Andy Freeman, punk monk, is a good friend of mine. Um, and he says this, like pebbles that are smoothed by the rocking motion of the sea with their rough edges being knocked off by other stones, we too experience the same refining and changing as a group of people. There's safety in this bunch of people, like a family in the right sense of the word. Our rough edges are smoothed off as we realize we will not be rejected or abandoned or doubting or making a mistake. And also that we are loved for who we are, not who we may become or what we can do. As a group of people, our lives are knitted together. Uh, maybe again. Jesus urged his followers to love one another. We are realistic about community. It's not always easy. But we're committed to the idea of authentic community and, more importantly, to enabling authentic community to happen in and around us in maybe. The journey is a shared journey, and we long for it to be a grace-filled one. We have committed ourselves to being peaceful in our exchanges with each other, giving no space to sarcasm or aggression. We are cultivating generosity. We are practicing forgiveness, and we honor each other. I quite like the idea of practicing forgiveness. I certainly need to practice it. Um, and the Forsaken Church, we have, uh, when we have a living example of sacrificial hospitality and caring, then suddenly words explode with meaning from the pages of Scripture. And when we read Genesis 18, Abraham's visitors, it becomes a living story that we can place ourselves in. Sorry if I'm just clicking on before you take the photo. So that's the second one, reframing community. Um, the third one is reframing spirituality. Uh, and obviously this is quite key. You'd imagine this was quite key if we were talking about uh, monasticism and the religious life. But it's quite, been quite an interesting journey to talk to people and see how communities are thinking about this. And so many of the communities are thinking about rhythms. Um, and in fact, so many of the communities are thinking about how do we do a rhythm of life. But one of the practical chapters we put in the book was how do you go about developing a rhythm of life as a community? 
that's not imposed from above or copied from somewhere else, but actually reflects your own rhythm. Because rhythms are natural. Um, and too often people can try and impose these rhythms of life or buy them from somewhere else, and they don't work because they become obstructions. They become obstacles rather than a, a real rhythm. And different communities are different but, uh, because they're, they're made up of different kinds of people. So how you develop a rhythm of life and a rule of life, not a rule for life, but a rule of life, how you develop those together is, is quite important. And most of the communities are saying, look, we need to see our spirituality as uh, more than what we do on a Sunday and when we come together for a prayer group and more than a 15-minute quiet time or whatever you do. What we want to do is to find a holistic spirituality that sees all of our life as our spirituality. So how do we train ourselves to think about life as prayer and life as revelation? So as we walk, where do we encounter God? Where do we, where do we learn as we walk the streets, as we sit down with someone? So that question is going on about what is spirituality that's holistic? And so some of that is about practices, which we might come on to, and some of it is about attitude, postures, which we'll come on to. Um, but it's about being resonant, uh, reflective and resonant. Uh, note the word resonant, not relevant. Um, most communities don't like, we don't like the word relevant, because relevance is a false word, it's a, and it's an attempt to be something, and oh, I, I'll be relevant to them. No, we need to be resonant. So instead of trying to say, well, if I do this, you'll like that. But actually, no, how do we together resonate? How do we find a way that encompasses and shares? Um, how do we uh, experience something which actually, um, you know, when somebody new engages, it changes all of us, not, you know, just them. That sense of resonance. Um, it's also about intercession. So it's about, particularly about risen, rhythm and rhythms that are resonant, um, but it's about intercession. And of course you wouldn't be surprised at that, because most monasticism has got this rhythm of prayer through the day. And for, for all of these communities, for most new monastic communities, the, one of the key things is how do we pray for the place you put us in? Because our heart is about loving and seeking to love those places, so intercession is really important. And it's grown in terms of these communities to be much more than the five minutes in part of a service to be much more of a way of life, how we're living lives of prayer and intercession for the places. Um, so there's a lot of brokenness in terms of intercession. But it's also about creativity and participation. That actually spirituality is, is about how we're creative too. And, and pretty much all of this, and this goes, it's a bit difficult in the Church of England, but uh, pretty much all of the communities that I know write and create their own liturgy. And they write music. And, uh, and they do all sorts of things about creativity. How we express, instead of buying in somebody's expression that we can go, oh, we feel a bit like that, so we use that. But how do we actually create stuff which reflects who we are and grows from our creativity? So rhythm and rule, reflective and resonant, intercession, and creativity and participation. Of course, that means if we're encouraging those things, particularly participation, not all of what we do will be very good. So what? Um, you know, it's not about sleekness. It's about actually how we encourage and people to express themselves. It's this idea of pilgrimage. Michael Mitten. Now is surely the time to become open again to the Spirit of God who desires to come to the most intimate places of our lives, praying, healing, and transforming us, so that we may be released to a new sense of pilgrimage and divine restlessness. Or another way of putting it uh, that, that I quite like is uh, on the gap. Yeah. You won't be surprised, but 24-7 prayer says, says, we try to mirror a Celtic pattern of life, a balance of work and of study, of rest and of prayer. The rhythmic heartbeat of continual prayer pumps life around these communities. Through the watches of the night as people come and go, their prayers lift everything else to another dimension. Boiler rooms, which are 24-7 prayers, um, physical presence, they have these boiler rooms around the country. Um, aren't just art centres and mission stations. They are, in some strange way, a place where God can be found. It's all about intimacy with God, infection with the gospel, and effectiveness in our Christian lives. A moot. Moot seeks to live a Christian spiritual rhythm of life through practising presence, acceptance, creativity, balance, accountability, and hospitality. And they say, the danger of creating a rhythm of life is that it can just remain words on a page, like a doctrine of belief. 
ticked off but not lived. This is not the purpose of a rhythm of life, which is more about being a constant challenge, something that needs to be faced, explored constantly, something that requires a commitment. A great image for this is the idea of entering a river and immersing yourself in the water. We are called to immerse ourselves in the rhythm in a, in a similar way. And maybe. The ancient Jewish and Christian faith texts picture God as being constantly and deeply creative. This God creation activity is not a one-off event, but continuous. A constant recreation that will culminate according to the faith text in all things being made new, restored, and put to rights. We sense that the God-inspired desire uh, to be creative is one of the vital impulses that makes us human. So that's the third one, reframing spirituality. The fourth, and the, the, the final one of these that I'm talking about, is about mission. Reframing mission. Um, Andrew Jones, who's a, a New Zealander, someone was actually going to use a back from New Zealand. Um, I said, I said, that's, that came out wrong then, didn't I? I said, anyone you've heard about New Zealand? I mean, has anyone heard of Andrew Jones? Um, there we go. Andrew Jones said uh, that, that pilgrimage is the, is the post colonial, or is becoming the post colonial mission. Uh, and uh, he's currently, currently driving around. God knows where, in a big van. <laughs> I don't mean, know where he is at the moment. Um, but the idea that actually that uh, mission is, is about journeys, about where we go. Um, in our community in Safe Space, we talk about uh, three things as our kind of, if you like, our, uh, our mission, or I don't know what you call it, just a statement. We talk about community, um, um, and we talk about pilgrimage, and we talk about mission. And we say that we are, want to intentionally be community, warts and all, with all the struggle that that is. Um, both a physical community and a spiritual community. We want uh, to do that as we walk, as we see ourselves living in the community, as we walk around the community, um, and as we encounter God in the community. And then thirdly, we say, when you do that, mission happens. Because you can't avoid the people that God's leading you to. You can't sit there saying, well, let's go out, because you are out. <laughs> um, and that's a big part of how we try and live. So we talk about being peregrinati, um, holy wanderers, I don't know if you've come across that phrase before. Um, and there's a great uh, Tolkien said it, didn't he? You know, not all who wander are lost. Uh, the idea of being wanderers. Of seeing mission as about incarnation rather than recruitment. Um, and for it to be about transformation, both global and locally. And then there's a, a phrase that you're, uh, I'm sure, familiar with. Um, those of you that are ordained, those of you that are studying, probably all of you. That mission is actually about God. And the phrase is Missio Dei. Yeah. I know it sounds a bit strange. The mission is actually about God. Um, but not only is it about God, but it is God. Um, the phrase Missio Dei, and I think it was John B. Taylor who said, you know, mission is not an activity of the church, but an attribute of God. So as we engage with God, we are called into mission. Um, and particularly in our Western society, um, the, the community itself is mission. That in a society that doesn't know how to do community and is focused on individualism and consumerism, then the commandment to love one another is a, is a, is a gospel act. It's the sharing of the way God intended things to be. So, pursuit of a mission lifestyle. Bevins and Schroeder, the Catholic theologians, uh, wrote this, the community participating in God's life is God's special people, a people living God's life in a covenant of relation and love people convinced of its fundamental equality through its common baptism in the name of the triune God. But as communion in mission, this image takes on a dynamic meaning as God's people on pilgrimage. God's people chosen not for themselves, but for God's purpose. Um, a great, I want to tell you a little example of this. Um, and uh, it, it only it happened last September, and uh, I, I mentioned that with my work, I work for a mission society, and so I get to do a bit of travelling in my role, and I've travelled to some great places, and in, um, in September last year, I went to Brazil, and uh, I, I'm a big fan, one of my favourite films is the film City of God, I don't know if you've seen it, a few nods, great film, uh, about the favela that the government uh, built in the 1960s, and it became, the, uh, it became known as the most violent place on earth. 
and uh, the birth of gang culture in, in, uh, in Brazil and, and the violence and the drugs that went with it. And uh, we went anyway, on one day on our itinerary, we were going to meet a guy called Nicholas. And Nicholas was a priest, an, uh, an Anglican priest in, uh, in the city of God. Um, and I have to admit, I was both excited and a bit nervous about going to the city of God. And we went to, to, to meet, and he showed us around the church and what they were doing. And he said, right, we're going to go for a walk in the city, into the city. And we went and we ate in this sort of community uh, the, the, um, restaurant where you could get a cheap meal. And there were sat next to a guy who was, or sat opposite a guy who was, who was clearly out of his skull on something. He kept zoning out. And then he was shaking and all sort of things. And kind of worried. Um, and then off we went into the city. And we were walking around looking at some of the street <coughs> art projects they were doing and various things. And then suddenly, as we were stood on a corner, this young lass, young lady came over and stood next to us and started babbling away in Portuguese. Um, well, my Portuguese is worse than my Australian. <laughs> and uh, so I didn't understand a word she was saying, but she clearly just had a baby. And so, you know, she chatted away and Nicholas came over and talked to her. And, uh, and, and then she went off. And then after a while of talking, Nicholas said, right, we're going to go on off and see this baby. And we set off down the main street and suddenly, after you know, 100 yards or so, we turned right, right into the middle of the favela, right to the, the heart of it. And it was the street, you will see a picture of it, it was very narrow, and you could see guns and drugs and all sorts going on. And I turned to one of my colleagues, um, and we'd just had our safety briefing with her, because we have to, when we travel, we have to have a safety briefing about how not to get kidnapped or not to get ourselves into places of trouble. And I turned around and said, is this sensible? He went, no, not really. <laughs> and, and, and off we went and we followed Nicholas and, so, and then um, as we got deeper and deeper into the favela suddenly out of the favela came this lady uh, and here she is and that's Nicholas looking over this is the, the river that runs through the city of God um, and, and, this, and this lady came and this is the lady with the, with the, uh, the baby you can see the, the streets okay. and um, she came out with this little baby was five days old, and as we stood there, and, she, and Nicholas was translating, he said, she's just asked if we would bless her baby. Mm -hmm. So we gathered round, and his name is Tiago Gabriel, James Gabriel. So if you ever fancy praying for anybody, and you can't think of anyone, pray for little Tiago Gabriel. Mm -hmm. um, and, and growing up, his mum had literally, she hadn't managed to get off crack cocaine during the pregnancy, but after he'd been born, she, she, hadn't, well, she hadn't done any for five days. Um, and we gathered around and we prayed a blessing. And then we went afterwards, we, we sort of left. And we chatted a bit, we left. I went back to where I was staying, and I was staying with the, the chaplain at the, uh, uh, one of the Anglican churches in Rio. And I told him this story, and his name is Ben. Ben said, ah, yes, he said, Nicholas. Nicholas is like Jesus. He just walks the streets and blesses people. Mm. And I thought, what a great, that's a really great image for mission mm -hmm. in the context of what we're trying to do as an expression of, you know, 1 Thessalonians 2, you know, that, that, that sense of you know, going and sharing life um, and living a life of presence and blessing. Um, and I think that, in a way, was a great, for me, it's a great little story which kind of brought together some of the thinking that, that we've been doing, that other new monastics have been doing. And said, well, actually, if mission is less about recruitment of the church and more about walking the streets and blessing where we go and being open to where God is leading us, um, then, then we're on to something. Um, oh, there's, a, there's an Australian quote coming up here. <laughs> oh, that's good. I'd forgotten that wasn't was in there. Um, yeah, small boat, big sea. Yeah. Yeah. Um, participants are invited to join a community who are concerned for, with global issues, who pray for peace, who work toward the extension of God's kingdom around the world, who are committed to truth, justice, and mercy, who listen to God's word, who feed the poor and take in the lost. Now, I don't know much about my uh, community, but I just like this quote, and I think this captures some of the thinking that people are going through. Well, actually, that we're all invited to join in with this. A prayer and it working towards the extension of God's kingdom, committed to truth and justice, who listen to God's word, who feed the poor and take in the lost. Um, and what I really liked about that was that it doesn't break it down into different aspects or activities. It's all entwined. Listening to God's word, feeding the poor, taking in the lost. Maybe about their community. Words are relatively easy. The tough bit is doing it living the vision, being Christ's community, and becoming more faithful followers of Christ. We know that this will take commitment, energy, time, and grit. 24-7 prayer. 
Because Christ came not to condemn the world, but to save and reconcile it, we value authentic relationships with God, others, and all creation. We seek to walk lightly upon the earth and to participate in God's creating, redeeming, and sustaining dream for the world. I guess you can see in that that, that within, I think, certainly within new monasticism, there is the sense that mission and salvation are, are now, not something for the future. So this is, you know, saved now, being saved, been saved, will be saved. This is the whole sense of actually our mission is the whole, the five marks of mission, holistic mission. Um, so that's something about mission that it becomes, and I'll talk about some of our, uh, our stuff as we go through this next little section. Um, I'm just aware we've been talking a bit. Do people want a five minute comfort break? Okay, there's a few nods, so let's do that. <coughs> Handbrake.